Good evening. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Laurie, for that introduction. Uh, again, I'm David Klein. Um, I'm not going to stay up here very long, uh, but hello. But uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, start off by just defining what public history is, um, and then tell you a little bit about the projects. And then you'll hear directly from uh, all the students who worked on them this evening. So I'll get out of the way then. But first of all, uh, I just want to talk about, for a moment, what is public history? Um, so um, recently, the Board of Directors of the National Council of Public History uh, define it thusly, a movement, methodology, and approach that promotes the collaborative study and practice of history. Its practitioners embrace a mission to make their special insights accessible and useful to the public. Okay, so kind of a mouthful for something that's supposed to be about public accessibility to history, right? So my shorthand definition is the way that history is presented to and used by the public. So all of the many and various ways in which mediated history is around us all the time and we interact with it. So historic sites, uh, those roadside markers that we drive by and ignore most of the time, um, uh, th museums, things like that, uh, national parks. So, um, and public history is the study of all of these places and the people who practice history uh, in these sites. Um, and you can think of all the other ways in which we get our history from uh, nowadays with uh, um, history and uh, documentaries on television and things like that. So um, it's also the study of those who practice. So the archivists, the filmmakers, the academic historians who work with the public, um, those people who, um, as Ed Linenthal says it, commit history in public. Um, and the, the faculty of the history department at Virginia Tech uh, have been among those uh, brave enough to commit history in public for a number of years now. Uh, and the department has recently hired um, two public historians, myself included, to uh, really promote these efforts um, as part of what we do in the department. So you'll be uh, seeing a, a lot more of our students um, bothering you all uh, in the coming years. Um, so look forward to that. Um, so I had um, the good fortune of joining the, the history department this fall uh, and was charged with working with the talented group of uh, graduate students who you'll hear from this evening. And together over the past few months, we've explored the ins and outs of public history practice, uh, methodology, uh, ethics, um, a lot of the, the theory um, uh, about in the field. But I also wanted, because public history is about doing, I wanted them out and doing projects as well. So that was about really uh, a large part of the class, was working on four different projects. Uh, not just the oral history project that was mentioned, but a total of four. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you just briefly about those projects, and then the students will, themselves will go into much greater detail. Uh, and I'm going to add a few thanks here as I, um, as I uh, tell you the projects. So the first one was uh, working with the town of Blacksburg to develop an oral history program um, uh, focusing on longtime residents of Blacksburg. And I want to thank Terry Nicholson, the museum administrator, and Laurie Tolliver-Jones, who we heard from, um, for their help on that. Um, secondly, one of our students worked with the Salem Museum, uh, taking an um, exhibit on the Civil War and translating that into a PowerPoint that can be used uh, by teachers. So that was a second project. The third project, oh, and I want to thank um, John Long, the director of the Salem Museum there. Um, the third project you'll be hearing about uh, took place up at the Mountain Lake Hotel in Conservancy. Uh, and what, um, a place that has a very long history that was interested in finding new ways to tell that, that history, um, really beyond the story of, of dirty dancing. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you'll hear from that group as well. And I really want to thank Jessica Coker, who's the interim director of the Conservancy, for all of her help there. Um, and finally, the, the fourth project was the Blacksburg Farmers Market. Um, who came to us interested in documenting their own 25-ish um, year history uh, and really gathering and preserving their, uh, their archives before that history is lost. Uh, a really sort of fundamental community uh, project here within Blacksburg and getting that history down. Uh, so I want to thank Ellen Stewart, uh, the market director, uh, and the board of directors of the market for bringing that project to us and really helping us with it. Um, I'd also like to thank Mark Barrow uh, and the history department 
um, at Virginia Tech uh, for hiring me and, um, <laughs> and uh, for giving me the latitude to do projects like this, which is just um, terrific. And I also want to thank Michelle James Duramo, who um, is the director of the Service Learning Center for Student Engagement and Community Partnerships um, at Virginia Tech. I had, I just moved here on August 1st. So I had this interesting challenge of trying to do community history in a community to which I did not, in which I did not yet belong. <laughs> so, um, and um, I, I was able to reach out to Michelle um, James Drama, who put out a call uh, to the Blacksburg community for um, uh, partners that would be interested in working with students on a project like this. And we got a whole bunch of responses. So it was just a, um, a terrific, a sort of welcome to, to this area, uh, that people were so willing to share their history and get involved in this way. Uh, so um, thank you to them uh, and to you all. Um, and finally, I want to just thank the Town of Blacksburg again for including us uh, in this uh, series this evening. I can't think of a better way to sort of share with you the results of community history um, than to bring it into a setting like this. So without um, further ado, the order tonight is going to be the Oral History Series, the Salem Museum, uh, Mountain Lake Hotel, and finally the Blacksburg <coughs> Farmers Market. And what I'll, we'll have time for questions at the end of all of those. Uh, so I'll ask you to hold your questions till then. And I'll turn it over to the first group who will introduce themselves and we'll be off and running. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Good. I'm Kathy Koch, and I want to introduce uh, my other group members. This is Matthew Walker and Allison Vick, and we work together on the Oral History Project. And for many years, the Virginia Tech History Department has had a relationship with the town of Blacksburg, whereby they've worked together toward the preservation of Blacksburg's history. And this summer, the Service Learning Program in the Center for Student Engagement and Community Partnership at Virginia Tech put out a call uh, for projects to be conducted with the Graduate Public History Seminar. And Terry Nicholson uh, responded to that and contacted Dr. David Klein. And they agreed to work together to collect the oral histories of some of the town's long-term residents. And the three of us uh, had the honor of taking on this project. And there were several possibilities we had to approach this project. And our desire was to implement a project that would not just be this semester, that could continue for years down the road. So what we decided to do uh, after consulting with the museum committee is we interviewed three long-term citizens of Blacksburg. And we wanted to look at the commonalities with those interviews and then find a common theme and use that as a foundation for the future so other students could come behind us and continue on with this project. So the first uh, three that we chose to interview, you can see here, is Shirley Strother, Francis Russell, and Verl Payne. The reason that this project came about the way it did uh, as an oral history project was for a, a, a number of different variables. Number one, uh, we saw that we could get the history of Blacksburg uh, just through going through old records, through newspaper articles, through court records, uh, or even reading the histories that have already been written. But we wanted to get beyond that in a way that really incorporates the voice of Blacksburg and the citizens who've lived here. Uh, so the attempt here is to get to the information that has been lost in those very public and very formal documents. So it's a very informal way to, to learn about the histories and the experiences uh, that sometimes don't get put into public news. Uh, the second reason was to give a voice to people uh, and to communities that sometimes do not find themselves in those traditional avenues of history and of, um, of publicity. And the third, actually, is in this project itself, we see this as a very truly public history. So we are not creating what we believe is the history of Blacksburg and then presenting it to you for you to judge and mull over. We are asking you to tell us what the history of Blacksburg was for you and how this, how this town has grown and how it has experienced throughout your life. So as we uh, went through this project and interviewed, as Kathy said, our, our three participants the way we started out, we, we get, began to develop and see certain themes that were coming through our interviews uh, through our participants. Number one, we began to see that Blacksburg as a community itself was very big and very important through the lives of, of the citizens as they grew up. The feeling of being together, the feeling of support and help, uh, that was mentioned a lot about how the town of Blacksburg uh, and its citizens really knew each other and felt very safe. Uh, the second we found was recreation, play, how people enjoyed themselves and found themselves out, out and about. 
Uh, the third is the impact of Virginia Tech on Blacksburg. Uh, to be honest, when we started the project, we really were looking, I guess, for a way to find the history of Blacksburg uh, that was maybe a bit separate from Virginia Tech. That was just Blacksburg in itself. Uh, and as we went through, we realized this is very much impossible to separate these two things, that they impact each other on very deep levels. Uh, and so that was the, the next thing we found. Uh, finally, we found the evolution and growth of Blacksburg, how things have changed how things have gotten bigger and, and reasons why and, and how they've impacted your lives. And finally, uh, one of the last ones was church involvement and how churches have, have changed and also how being a member of church and, and, and being a part of the church was big throughout the life. Uh, so I think to start this off, what we'd like to do, um, I think the first uh, interviewee you're going to hear from is, is Ms. Payne. Uh, and we're going to go through certain clips that we, that we had of our interviews that really show you what these themes are uh, and how they began to be embodied. But forgive me, we're going to be a lot getting up and, and sitting down a lot, so there's a lot of movement going on. Matt talked about one of the themes is recreation, and that's the focus of mine with Mrs. Payne. Um, I had the, the privilege to interview her, and I asked her to tell me of some of her memories about holidays in Blacksburg. And she recalled the time when her and her family lived in the Wright House, which is located on the Virginia Tech campus. And she said she had purchased ice skates for her children for Christmas. But then during the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, it snowed and the duck pond was frozen. So she gave the children uh, ice skates early. And she went on to talk about um, this was a real focal point for the community. And I think you'll see that from what she says in this snippet of her interview. Oh, getting back to ice skating. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to freeze over that much anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, the upper part of the duck pond is so much, uh, it, it's, it's not very deep. So that section would freeze when the lower one didn't. But we, I know Ellison Smythe, who lived here, was a Presbyterian minister, tall, slender, and people used to talk about how he would uh, ice skate. People would go just to watch him ice skate. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how well you could hear the sound, but she talked about Ellison Smythe, who was the Presbyterian minister, and how people would love to go out and just watch him skate. So you could see how the community would come together. But then I, was, I thought it was humorous uh, because she was talking about she gave her children the ice skates early and I asked her if she ever skated because she's a very athletic woman. And she's like, no, the children were embarrassed by her being out on the ice pond. So she waited until after dark when everyone was gone, she borrowed her daughter's ice skates and then she would go out and skate on the duck, duck pond in the dark. And I must say, every time since this interview I've passed the duck pond, I think about her story. And that's what oral history is. From what she has told me, her memories have now become part of my memories of Blacksburg. All right, it was my pleasure to interview Mrs. Uh, Shirley Strother. She was a highly involved professor in the Department of Family and Child Development at Virginia Tech for 30 years, as well as the director of the Virginia Lab Tech Lab School for 20 years, which is now the Child Care Center on Tech's campus. The audio clip you're about to hear um, tells us a little bit about what the lab school was like in the, from the 1950s through into the 1980s. And it talks about the innovative and progressive nature of the facility in working with both students and children. We had parents' meetings and all, all sorts of interesting stories with the children and so forth. It really, it was a very interesting job in that um, I had, I worked with children, but I also worked with, with the students. It, you know, it was an interesting I thought it was interesting. We um, did a lot of art mm -hmm. with the with the children, and uh, we did a lot of having them talk about their art. And uh, like uh, like one child, I remember lightning had struck in the backyard, and he was oh he was doing <clears throat> all sorts of pictures, all sorts of reds and yellows and everything, just bursting onto the 
onto the paper, you know, and you mm -hmm. you could sort of figure out where it came from, and then you could begin to get him to talk about it. All right, so as you can see, the lab school did a lot of things. As uh, Ms. Struther told me, they actually did not ask the children, what are you drawing? They had the children tell you what they were drawing, which is a definitely a more progressive idea that you see in places like Montessori schools as well. So in addition to being a state-of-the-art facility, Ms. Struther explained that it was also closely tied to the community and that the Blab School brought in a lot of parent involvement and it also prepared students working within the field of family and child development to go on and pursue their careers in that field when they got out of school. So it was a very unique experience for them. And through her recollections, I understood that it was really clear that it's very difficult to separate the history of Blacksburg from the history of Virginia Tech. And so I think that really is seen through her work with the lab school. And finally, the, the last interview that we have uh, is Miss Russell. Uh, and when I interviewed Miss Russell, uh, one of the big things that she, she talked about and mentioned a lot was church involvement and the changes of churches throughout uh, Blacksburg's history. Uh, the clip you're about to hear actually comes after I asked her the question of how she met her, her first husband, uh, Mr. H or Dr. Hutchison. Um, and she begins to describe uh, that their families went to the same church. And from that conversation, there was a, a discussion uh, that she went down about how churches have, have changed over the time, uh, over the past 70 years. And so that's what we're, we're going to hear just a little bit of. Churches were very, played a big part in your life, your social life and everyday life. Um, the Presbyterian Church was downtown. It's the church, uh, now is the Church of God. But that was the Presbyterian. Actually, the first Presbyterian church was where that um, Cabo fish place is. That was, a, that was a church early, early, early on. I think you can tell when you go in, it looks like there's almost like a balcony up and um, the dark wood. And then they moved to the church on Roanoke Street, which is now the Church of God. And that church has Tiffany windows. And that's the church I was married in. And what I found really interesting is after this discussion, um, Miss Russell then began to describe how her mother was involved in the church. Uh, and, and how the church, you know, was a place where, where everyone went and, and knew each other. There was also more of a discussion about how the community of Blacksburg was a very safe place and, and the things that she loved to do and how she knew everyone and how her father used to have a putting green in his backyard uh, when they lived on Progress Street and people would come from the post office and come over and just see what he was doing and how things were going uh, and that everyone knew everyone and you could ride your bike and feel safe. And the, and the discussion about the changes and growths of churches uh, relates to that community development of Blacksburg. Uh, and so finally, I think for the last part of our, uh, our discussion, our presentation, is uh, Allison's going to come back up and talk about some possible ways to, to improve this project in the future. All right, so as you've heard through all three of our audio clips that we've played, um, our group discovered a number of interesting topics from all of our interviewees. And the most common thing that we found through our inter three interviews was how closely tied Virginia Tech's history was to the history of Blacksburg as a community. And because we interviewed a very diverse, diverse and dynamic group of ladies, we found a lot of topics that need further exploration. And some of the ones that we really wanted to pursue, pursue were national topics, such as World War II, uh, civil rights, but also local topics, such as um, the development of downtown Blacksburg and the businesses that came in. As Matt pointed out, recreation was a topic that came up a lot, as well as education and religion. And so as we've said before, um, the program with the Oral History Blacksburg Project is going to continue in the subsequent semesters, both with the work with uh, Dr. Klein started and through the public history program and our collaboration with the Blacksburg Museum Committee. We're going to continue to collect oral histories from Blacksburg's uh, residents. And some of the ways we want to do this is from additional single interviews. Um, we would like to get more of a, or increasingly diverse groups of people that we're interviewing. We've also thought about having a group of people interviewed at that one time, perhaps five or six people, and share, having them share some memories of the town and see what kinds of stories we'll get when we interview a group instead of, and see how the dynamics change in a group setting versus a single interview. 
And finally, we also liked the idea of doing an artifact-centered interview. And what we meant by that was having people bring in a special object they think really signifies the history of Blacksburg to them. And having them share that with us and with a group and seeing how, what kinds of stories we can derive from that. And finally, um, our group wanted to leave you with a quote that we found from Kathy's interview with Ms. Payne. And that is that anything worth saving is worth sharing. And thank you all. Hello. My name is Barbara Bowser, and um, I'm one of Dr. Klein's students. I have 20 years experience in the museum business as a living history interpreter. My last gig was at uh, Virginia's Explore Park. I spent you know, almost 10 years there. Um, my specialty is colonial America, but the project I was working on was Civil War related, so obviously I had to bone up on Civil War history a little bit. Um, one thing I wanted to share with you was my definition of public history, and it's uh, the history that is not just done in front of the public, but is done for the public good. And it's kind of what um, the last group was talking about. Um, museums are obligated by their um, mission to reach as many visitors as they can. And sometimes some of those visitors can't get to the museum. And in the case of Salem Museum in Salem, Virginia, uh, they knew that some of the students from the local schools could not get to the, um, to the museum to see their exhibit on the Civil War. And so they wanted to put together a PowerPoint presentation to put on their website so that the local schools could, in fact, um, share in this exhibit. And that's where I came in. Um, I had done something like this for Explore Park, and so they thought it was a good idea to try to do it again, and they had also done another one, so it's a good idea from that perspective, too. Um, the Salem Museum is located on the main street in Salem across from Berglund Ford, if you're interested in visiting, and their exhibit is called The Fiery Ordeal Through Which They Passed, and it's based on this quote by uh, William McCauley, who was a veteran of that war, and so that was where the title for the exhibit as well as the PowerPoint show came from. It was decided to go with fifth grade for the SOLs um, or the standards of learning because they studied the U.S. to 1865, and they wanted to, the Salem Museum wanted to include enough information that would interest other grades besides just the fifth grade, but it was pretty much for the fifth graders. And it includes the things that are in the exhibit to some extent, but it also adds in some more things that the exhibit wasn't covering, a little more about the national part of this war and things like that. So that's what I was doing, was trying to add to that. The exhibit talks about the local skirmishes, the local home front situation, some of the local leaders, such as the Dyerly Boys, who led a lot of the local militia groups, and diary entries, letters, government documents, things like that are included in the exhibit. The Salem Museum um, installed this exhibit in a small room, or a small exhibit in a large room, with the pictures and images on the wall, or images and things on the wall, and having four of the display cases. This one holds a Confederate artilleryman's cap and uniform and some other accoutrements for that. Another one holds account books and other such items. And the third one has some odds and ends from the war, including a cannonball that was found somewhere in Salem. And the last is a display of rifles. It's mostly military focused, but there is some home front as well as um, letters and diaries, as I said earlier. It is a local view of the war, which is what it was supposed to be. I'm going to talk about more about the SOLs. The SOLs are, um, are standards of learning, are a framework for teachers, and they use the framework to 
sketch out how they're going to talk about certain topics. The standards of learning for um, the fifth grade is the U.S. to 1865, and it focuses a lot on leaders and battles, the famous people like um, Lincoln and Lee and people like that. And the advantage, of course, of the Salem exhibit is that it's not talking about this people that everybody knows about, it's talking about people that the local people may know about. It includes African Americans and women and things like that in the SOLs. This one focus, this is the one that focuses the most on women and African Americans and um, that is where I was gonna add a lot more to the PowerPoint presentation that wasn't in the exhibit. And it also this is where they talk about the women more and the African Americans more. Public historians would advocate the inclusion of these people more often than they actually are in the SOLs because they're people that we don't hear as much about. And so some of the things that I found out about with the research I was doing for Salem was they actually have some references from an African American who escaped for a brief time from his master and hid away and so some of that got included in the in the PowerPoint presentation but wasn't in the exhibit. Where I got some ideas for the PowerPoint was from an exhibit thing I did for Virginia's Explore Park where I had a uh, a little mouse, an animated mouse, as a guide for a tour. And so I thought the same idea would be good for this exhibit. For this exhibit, I chose a war horse. Only the, ex the uh, image I chose of the horse was more of a farm horse with delusions of grandeur. And so this is Hannibal the war horse. He has an, uh, an attitude, too. He's got his nose in the air. Now, one thing about adding him I, in the director John Long and the assistant director Helen Johnson really did like him. I thought it might be a little silly for fifth graders, but they loved it and so wanted to see more and more of him. So I added him to a lot more of the slides. And one of the things that allowed me to do also was talk about livestock in the war and how horses were uh, used in the war and things like that. So I uh, mentioned things like the first casualty of the war at um, Fort Sumter was a horse and things like that. These two books were some of what I got information from, particularly uh, the files that Norwood um, Middleton used in, his, in putting his book together. And uh, the problem with his files, and he says it in the foreword, he said the research footnotes are glaringly absent, which made it very difficult as a historian to figure out where he got all his quotes from. So when I wanted to use a quote, I had to go to his files, and even th those were hard to use. So, once I'd begun creating the um, actual PowerPoint, I had to find more images, and that sent me to the internet. And the problem with using the file, uh, images on the internet is trying to figure out whether they're actually public domain or not. And with the Civil War, you have a lot of Civil War sites, and people put a lot of different pictures on there, and you don't know where they get them from. And so that's where I had the most problem, was trying to figure out whether I was stealing a picture from the Library of Congress or something like that, and I'm still working on that part of it. And some of that sent me back to the files to see if I could figure out where a lot of those documents came from, like I said. This project allowed me to work in an era with which I was not familiar. And in doing so, I discovered a lot of interesting facts and challenges. And having been a museum educator and having had to create um, interpretation that was SOL compliant before, I found the SOL, SOLs to be just as frustrating as I remembered them. <laughs> <laughs> the public history class gave me a lot of insight that I, um, on the job of the public historian that I didn't know, uh, having been only in one aspect of it. And I invite you to um, visit the Salem Museum, not only to see the temporary exhibit on the Civil War, 
but to see the rest of the exhibits too. It is a fine local small museum that deserves our patronage. Remember, local history is your history. Thank you. My name is Stephen O'Hara, and I'm joined tonight by my fellow grad students, Billy Paxton and Kelly Greason. And together we represent the group assigned to Mountain Lake Hotel in Pembroke, which is not too far from Blacksburg. Um, just a sh quick show of hands, how many people here have been up to Mountain Lake before? Seen a lot of hands, okay. <laughs> well, we would just like to talk very briefly about our project, a booklet entitled Mountain Lake Hotel, A History. And I'll introduce the project, then Billy will discuss the hotel, its area and history. And finally, Kelly will look at some different ways of exploring history at Mountain Lake with an influence in public history. So first, a few people have been essential to the undertaking of this project. Dr. David Klein at Virginia Tech put out a call for possible projects for our public history graduate course, the idea being to supplement readings and discussions with an actual hands-on application of public history. Jessica Coker was someone who responded. Uh, Jessica is the interim director at Mountain Lake Conservancy, and she's been our primary contact throughout the semester, guiding us through the hotel, acting as liaison with the staff. And lastly, one of the great benefits of doing this via the public history class has been the constant input from our classmates um, every week and sometimes multiple times a week. So many ideas have bounced around since early September, and what you see tonight is a, is a product of all this collaboration. So as we begin to talk about the project, I'd like to pose just a few questions that have propelled our work. First, what is public history? At its essence, as Dr. Klein said, public history is history presented for the public. It's pretty much everywhere, and you've probably interacted with it on a daily basis without even knowing it, from museums, historic sites, plaques, documentaries, even a presentation like this. So our group was tasked to bring history to the public at Mountain Lake. And at our initial meetings, Jessica suggested such things as a historical script for the staff or a walking tour, but she also gave us considerable freedom to explore various options. So to help us formulate a plan, we did some research at various locations. Uh, special collections at Virginia Tech's Newman Library, which houses numerous articles, uh, pictures, brochures about the lake and, and the hotel. Uh, various non-traditional sources, uh, such as books and poems about written about the lake, inspired by the lake and some archives that have already been maintained at Mountain Lake Hotel itself. So this research helped us solidify our idea to create a booklet of the history of Mountain Lake. The booklet, which will not be published but will be available at Mountain Lake Hotel, will consist of two parts. First, the general history of the lake and hotel, including important people and events. And second, a series of historical interpretations, different ways of thinking about the lake's history. And these interpretations move from a localized look at the physical building as a place for history. It expands to exa examine the personal sense of community at Mountain Lake, and then broadens out even further to consider how the hotel has adapted to different culture, cultural change throughout time. So put as a whole, the entire booklet is designed to relate the history of the hotel, as well as its personal and cultural importance to the community in Southwest Virginia. But before we get to those interpretations, the booklet will begin with a history of the hotel and its surrounding area. So for that, I'll invite Billy to step on up. Thank you. Um, I would start out by apologizing. I seem to have caught a bit of a cold and it has stolen some of my voice. So I'll ask you to bear with me for the next couple minutes. Um, I would like to give a brief background on Mountain Lake, the hotel, and the conservancy for anyone who is not as familiar with its background. While there are still some debates over its exact origins, scientists do estimate the lake to be approximately 2,000 years old. And one of the reasons why it is so interesting is that it is, only, is one of only two natural lakes found in the state of Virginia. And while exploring Southwest Virginia, Christopher Gist, a surveyor and frontiersman, was credited with the first recorded sighting of Mountain Lake on May 11th, 1751. And in 1796, George Chambers purchased the land surrounding and including Mountain Lake and passed it on through his family after his death until Henley Chapman started buying up plots of the Chambers family land. 
Records do show that there was a wooden hotel in existence in 1880 in 1855. However, they are not positive on how long it had been in existence at that time. Uh, Brigadier General Herman Haupt and his family were developing a resort in the late 19th century there and dedicated themselves to making it a more profitable business. Then in 1891, the Mountain Lake Land Company bought the newly improved hotel from the house. And in 1930, William Lewis Moody Jr. of Galveston, Texas, who was at one time named the 10th wealthiest man in the United States, purchased the hotel. He founded the Affiliated National Hotel Company, which was one of the largest hotel chains in the United States in the 1930s and 1940s. And at the time of his death in 1954, there were 24 hotels as part of this organization. I'm um, sorry. The building or the picture on the left is of the Wooden Hotel, and the picture on the right is of the new Stone Hotel, which Moody built between 1936 and 1937. It was built impressively quick, despite being constructed during a very cold and snowy winter. Mary Moody Northern, the oldest daughter of Moody, took over his estate and his businesses after his death in 1954. The affiliated National Hotel chain dissolved after his death and the Galtex Hotel Corporation now held the deed to the hotel. Mary Moody Northern bought this deed and she ran the hotel as a personal holding until she died in 1986 at the age of 94. Unfortunately, her last vacation to Mountain Lake, which she loved and visited frequently ever since she was young, came the year before that in the summer of 1985. Through her will, Mary Moody Northern uh, left the hotel to the Mary Moody Northern Foundation Incorporated, whose headquarters are in Galveston, Texas, and to this day they still maintain the deed to the hotel. The Conservancy uh, was founded in 1989 and it protects the land around it. Uh, their mission statement from their website says that the Mountain Lake Conservancy is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to fur further Mary Moody Northern's desire to forge bonds between people and nature in Mountain Lake's unique environment. Their vision of Mountain Lake is an internationally recognized ecotourism and educational destination. Their core values for their, for their organization are preserving and enhancing the integrity of Mountain Lake, Mountain Lake's unique environment through management decisions based on sound research, and providing educational opportunities for people of all ages, providing accessibility for all, designing an inspiring and memorable experience for their guests, as well as creating a, and fulfilling <clears throat> Sorry, as well as creating a fulfilling opportunity for its staff. And now I will pass the presentation on to my colleague Kelly, who will discuss the project we have been working on in greater detail. So, as uh, Billy and William have just, I'm sorry, Billy and Stephen have just described, the uh, book that we are creating will create will comprise an abridged version uh, history of the hotel. And it's intended to be, have a flexibility about it that it can be passed on to the hotel staff or picked up by the hotel guest and sort of easily thumb through to kind of gain a, a knowledge of the history of the hotel. And the second part of that booklet will address the three, three other issues in, in public history that we've looked at, and that is using the physical building, community, and culture of the hotel. And this just shows a plan using, when we speak about the, the physical spatial aspect of, of the building, showing the front of house lobby and uh, library. And um, I think given the hotel's extensive collection of photography, uh, the idea was to take some of that photography and perhaps use that in the library space down to the right, which is this slide. And actually, that's a picture of uh, Mary Moody Northern over the uh, fireplace. And those photographs really is borrowing from the hotel's collection, which are at this point in time on display in the guest uh, corridor. Um, and then this shows a elevation and perspective of what the idea of that would, uh, would encompass. And that's just really creating sort of a sanctuary for those historic photographs and, and a pictorial uh, view of the history of Mountain Lake. And then the uh, second 
uh, element that we looked at was the, uh, com the hotel, the uh, history of Mountain Lake as community. And actually this would be one of the pages out of the, uh, the booklet that will be uh, you know, housed at the hotel and in the lobby and the library. And the first photo at the top is, was taken in 1929 of the original hotel, which best encapsulate the idea of community with the veranda overlooking the lake. And this photo captures hotel guests enjoying the afternoon, talking amongst themselves, embodying that sense of community. And the photo below shows how guests remain connected to each other, both on and off the veranda. Oops. And then lastly, the final interpretation is Mountain Lake's relation to American culture over time. And the first photo shows the cascades of Mountain Lake and visually represents the general public's attraction to places like Mountain Lake or various healing springs and the development of these springs as important vacation spots. And another much earlier famous example of healing spring is pictured below. In conclusion, we invite you to visit Mountain Lake and enjoy the rich history that abounds on this beautiful site. And please take a look at our booklet, which should soon be in both the library and lobby of the main floor of the hotel. Thank you. Um, but before we launch uh, into the, uh, the presentation and the discussion itself, uh, I want to just take a, a brief moment to introduce my two colleagues we have, uh, who you'll see in a moment. Uh, we have Kimberly Staub, uh, who is a master's student in the Department of History. Uh, her research deals with uh, cooking in the uh, post-World War II era and sort of a, a national identity uh, creation related to food. And then we have Christopher Westfall. Uh, who's also a master's student in the Department of History, and he's doing some work on uh, the post-Civil War era in Southwest Indiana. And I am uh, Justin Shanks. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Science and Technology Studies, and my research deals with uh, the utopian hopes and dystopian reality of 20th century food production. Um, and the reason I go into all of this uh, is we have, a, a, as you can tell, a very diverse background um, and series of interests. And, um, our breadth of uh, experience dealing with food and community development and outreach and engagement, uh, archival collections, historical methodologies, the list goes on and on. Um, but really what it did is it prepared us to uh, take on a project with the Blacksburg Farmers Market um, that itself was very diverse and required a, a number of different skill sets and uh, you know, different <coughs> methodological approaches. Um, and when Ellen Stewart, uh, the director of the farmer's market, approached us in the beginning of the semester, explaining that she wanted to be engaged with this call that David had put out for public history projects, um, she presented us with a very broad um, scope uh, and really gave us the opportunity to engage with the farmer's market in a variety of different ways. And I should probably remember to use the PowerPoint. Um, so there are the names of the people who are here. Um, and we'll get to this in a second. Um, but using sort of the, the div diverse background that we all have, um, we came up with a number of different ideas. And also, whoop, what is going on? Sorry. I've used PowerPoint once or twice before. Um, but we also had a variety of different folks who were engaged in the process with us, and that further added to the sort of breadth and diversity with which we could approach this project. And um, as you can see from the variety of people and organizations up there, um, we had a number of different avenues, and many things were discussed in the early stages. We had ideas of digitizing photographs and documents from the farmer's market. We had the idea of creating an archival space uh, on the farmer's market's existing website. Um, and then we had some, some discussion about creating an on-site uh, display case and presentation area at the farmer's market. Um, and uh, we came up with a variety of different concepts. but. Really, uh, we ended up scaling back, realizing that there were a few initial steps that we needed to take um, in this, this longer uh, and more in-depth project. And um, we ultimately came up with uh, a series of goals for what we're calling phase one of the project. And you can see those represented, represented there. But uh, the basic idea was to establish a better sense of history for the farmer's market. Uh, it's an organization that's been around for approximately 25 years. Um, but there's some question about the exact origin uh, of the market, and, and we wanted to try to dig into that a little bit more to get a better sense of why it started and who the uh, significant people were in that. Uh, we also wanted to 
d develop a, a, a methodology or a way to engage with the multiple audiences in addition to those primary stakeholders that were listed uh, earlier. Um, yeah, I mean, there's various different patrons and vendors in the market, and we wanted to make sure their uh, stories and their experiences were represented, uh, as well as the sort of financial and logistic history of the market. Uh, and then finally, um, we wanted um, to engage uh, people in a variety of different uh, mediums and methodologies, including oral histories and documentary histories and so forth. Um, and now at the, the end of what we're calling phase one, again, um, we've accomplished a few of those, those main goals. The first is we have started a collection of, of physical artifacts and digital artifacts. Uh, we are gathering and presenting that history in those multiple mediums and multiple areas. Uh, and then finally, we've created sort of a vision for phase two and beyond. But um, these are things that are gonna be more in depth uh, later in the project. Kim is gonna talk about uh, sort of our uh, accomplishments and findings from the project. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, Chris is gonna discuss the project uh, process itself and sort of the, the challenges and uh, accomplishments that we had in envisioning what we wanted to do. So hand it over to Chris and we'll go from there. Um, the process of creating the archive uh, centered, really centered around two basic activities. Uh, the first one was meeting with the various groups mentioned earlier to uh, really figure out what they wanted out of the project and what we were going to be able uh, to accomplish in this semester. And then after that, uh, we then went on to the second activity, which was actually going out, collecting the documents, um, and organizing them, uh, documenting them, and making, them, making the, the collection a little more user-friendly for the future as, a pro, as the, um, the process continues. Uh, the first step in this was really a meeting with uh, Dr. Aaron Purcell, who is the Director of Special Collections at the Virginia Tech Library, uh, to determine what types of documents would be most appropriate. Uh, Dr. Purcell recommended that in order to make the collection as useful as possible to future researchers, that we focus on two uh, different, uh, um, uh, uh, to focus on institutional and cultural documents. Uh, institutional documents are uh, essentially the official documents of an organization. Uh, these include items such as the charter, uh, meeting minutes, and any other document that shows how the organization was formed or governed. Uh, cultural documents, on the other hand, um, provide more insight into the culture and atmosphere of an organization, and these include things such as photographs, newsletters, uh, newspaper articles, and even personal stories. Uh, and by collecting both types of documents, the hope is that uh, researchers will not only be able to see the history of the organization, but more importantly, the larger role that uh, the, the, the Blacksburg Farmers Market uh, plays uh, for the vendors, patrons, and in the community of Blacksburg. Uh, once we knew what we were looking for, we then began our meetings with the Friends of the Farmers Market. Um, and we've already discussed what they hope to get out of the project, but at this point I think it's important to mention that a lot of what we learned in the class, we expected to have a lot of hesitancy from the group, uh, vendors, patrons, etc., cetera, uh, in working with us but we really didn't find this. Um, the group had done a lot on their own before we came into the picture um, in creating this archive. And that helped uh, in make our job uh, quite a bit easier in the long run. Um, and then after our meetings with the Friends of the Farmers Market uh, and gaining official approval from the organization to work in their name, uh, we began collecting materials. Um, we first began going through the items that the Friends of the Farmer's Market had already collected. And this was rather significant. Um, their holdings consisted of scrapbooks of, of, from items from the different events they've held, um, as, as well as the meeting minutes uh, from, I believe, their founding. Um, and these were already pretty organized and documented, and so that didn't really require a lot of attention from us. But they also had a couple boxes of items that were just labeled um, add to archive. Um, and these were really what, what interested us the most in this, this process, um, hoping that they would lead to more than what had just been in the scrapbooks. 
Um, a lot of what they had uh, wasn't necessarily appropriate for the project. It was more of general interest stuff for the group. But there were some very valuable items in here, including uh, some newspaper articles, uh, copies of advertisements they've placed, as well as um, some early design renderings of the market structure, which were rather different than what it ended up being. Um, but as we expected, these documents were largely just uh, the institutional documents and not necessarily the cultural items that we were looking for. Uh, so then the next step in our project was to begin soliciting vendors and patrons for these cultural items. Uh, we began this process by sending out a newsletter, uh, introducing our group, uh, what we were trying to do, and listing the types of items that we were looking for. Uh, this attempt, however, received little response. Um, and so we then moved on to actually going to the market. Um, we ran into some problems here, though, because uh, you can't really go up and just start talking to the vendors while they're trying to work. Uh, so we set up a table, and uh, but this too found little response. But we did get a lot of people who were willing to, who said they'd be willing to do uh, oral interviews in the future, which is something we then decided might be a good path to take as the the. Uh, process progresses. Um, so after completing our duties here, I guess, we had a significant collection of institutional documents, uh, but relatively few cultural documents. Um, but uh, this collection is a continual process, so it's the hope of our group that in the future uh, people will donate these items and the collection will grow. And so the final stage of this process is really to turn, what, uh, turn over what we have collected to special collections. Um, and that will come in the form of uh, Dr. Aaron Purcell, who's been very involved in our side of the project. Um, he'll fill out the legal form, because it is a legal document, giving their, um, the documents over, um, and a little bit beyond what we're allowed to do in class. Um, but really, that donation form just sets out restrictions, if there's any private information that needs to be sealed for however many years, um, how much gets digitized, when it gets digitized, those kinds of issues. But then it will be processed. And this involves a series of steps. The first is preservation. Things like removing staples, repairing ripped pages, placing things in acid-free folders, so that, aside from human error, uh, these documents will be around for as long as Virginia Tech exists and even beyond that. The next is arrangement, which really is what it sounds like. Um, you put the documents in a logical order so that researchers know what they're looking for and um, you group like items. And in this case, the records were really, really well kept, so there's not a whole lot of work to do there. And then um, one of the staff members at Special Collections will write a finding aid. And the photo, which is a little bit small and probably difficult to see, um, is just a screen clip of a finding aid. And all that really has, it's a description of the items in the list, a brief a uh, biographical or historical note about the organization so researchers know what they're looking at, um, how to cite it, how it's arranged, and then a contents list to make it easier for researchers or community members who wish to look at these documents um, so they know what they're looking at and it's easy to find. And once the finding aid is written, all these materials will be available in the reading room and I'll plug special collections um, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 in Newman Library. Um, we're open to any community member who wants to come in and look at any of our documents. And then the last stage is digitization. And a lot of this comes depending on when the staff time is. Uh, we are crunched, it's, it is a small, small department. Um, and then kind of how it's been laid out in the donation form. So even though our part of the project has largely been completed, we think that there are a lot of future directions. As Chris had mentioned earlier, we, um, we didn't really get as much cultural material as what we really wanted to do to really get the history of the market. And so we think an oral history project is probably the best way to um, get the stories and the memories from the people who went to the market, what kept them coming back week after week, why was it important for them to go, um, and why is it important to Blacksburg to have this market. We also hope to continue to develop the collection. Um, we know that there's a large collection of artwork out there. Um, Chris Pritchard um, does all the advertising and the artwork, and we haven't been able to get in touch with him, unfortunately, for this project. Um, we also know that every week there's music that's played at, at market, and to have something like that to show um, how the community interacts would be really, really important. But even though there are future steps, we have been able to accomplish a lot of things. Um, we feel that we've got given the farmer's market a really strong start, and we've collected a lot of important materials. 
you know, de developing a collection, especially for an organization that is still in existence, is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think the longer that um, the market is in existence and the longer the relationship between special collections and the Friends of the Farmers Market exists, more and more material will be added to the collection. We've also, as I just mentioned, established this relationship not only between um, special collections and Friends of the Farmers Market, but also with Virginia Tech and the public history um, professors at Virginia Tech. Um, it's important to set the stage for more students so more students can get involved and professors to keep the, the relationship strong. But on a more abstract level, we really think that we have helped people think historically about their own lives. Um, as, again, Chris had mentioned, people weren't really kind of open to donating their pictures, but we also think it's a little bit maybe they didn't see them as being part of the historical record. Um, we don't think that where we shop and you know what we do on a daily basis is historical, but it is. And um, you know, history really is a community effort. It's a it is public history. Um, it's important that you all, the public, the community, see yourself as stakeholders in society in public history, um, because historians can't do what they do unless we collect what we have. Um, and with that, uh, we'd like to thank you for your time. And I think we will <laughs> turn it back over for all of you if you have any questions for any of our groups.